As I hope you understand by now, ODE solvers are powerful and important tools, especially in the study of chaotic systems where paper and pencil won't give you the solution, but that they also make errors and that those errors are proportional to the step size and also the shape of the landscape. In forward Euler, the error term made those effects very obvious. That error is proportional to the square of the step size and the second derivative of the function. If the landscape is linear, forward Euler will give you a perfect answer regardless of the size of the time step. You can think about that in a number of ways. The first derivative is a perfect approximation of this landscape. Another way to think about it is that all of those other terms in the Taylor series, as well as this term, are zero for a linear system. If the landscape is not linear, then both the time step and the curvature matter. If the landscape is mildly curvy, but you take a very long time step, that can be bad. If the landscape is very curvy, then even a small time step may not save you. These issues are not unique to forward Euler. The other solvers that I mentioned in the previous segment all have similar issues. The exact form of the error is different in each one, but both the time step and the geometry of the landscape affect all of them. But those two factors, time step and geometry, are not the only cause of error in ODE solvers. There are also computational effects. Computers use what's called floating point arithmetic. Let's say your computer uses 32-bit wide boxes of memory to store things. And if you're storing a single number in a single memory location, that means that you have 2 to the 32 possible values to use to store that number. So let's say you wanted to be able to store numbers in a range of, say, negative 1 million to a million. A very simple way to do that with 32 bits is to divide up that range evenly into 2 to the 32 slots. 2 to the 32 is a pretty big number. So imagine we did that. Each of those little slots, not all of which I'm going to draw here because it would take me a long time, is 2 million over that wide, which is 0 0.00047 wide. Now what that means is that all the numbers in this range are all stored as the same 32-bit long binary pattern. It's just like having a calculator that has four digits in its display. Everything from 1.30000 to 1.30049 will get rounded to 1.300 on a calculator that could only display four digits. This box size here is often called the machine epsilon. And as you can well imagine, if you're doing arithmetic with numbers that are comparable to, or worse, smaller than that box size, the errors in your calculations are going to be large. Imagine, for instance, subtracting 1.3000 from 1.3001 on this calculator. Worse yet, imagine putting that result in the denominator of a calculation. Now, this simplified system that I've just outlined that evenly divides up the number range into even-sized chunks is not how floating-point arithmetic actually works. You don't need 10 decimal places when you're working with 900,047, but you do need lots of decimal places when you're working with a very small number. For those reasons, real computer arithmetic systems use a kind of scientific notation with bases and exponents and sign bits for each of those quantities. That allows those arithmetic systems to store big numbers with low precision and small numbers with high precision. And computers offer a range of different data types, You've probably heard of double precision numbers. Those use twice as much memory and provide both a wider range and better precision near zero. Now this notion of machine epsilon is pretty easy to think about when the number line is divided up into even size bins. In a simple arithmetic system like that, as I mentioned before, the machine epsilon is just the width of the smallest bin. But in more sophisticated computer arithmetic systems like the IEEE floating point standard, which use those bases and exponents and so on that I just mentioned, the bins are actually different sizes. They're big out near the ends and small near the middle, near zero. Again, this makes sense because you want more precision when you're working with smaller numbers, but it does make the concept of machine epsilon a little bit hard to define. One standard way that numerical computing people define machine epsilon is the difference between one and the next number above one that can be represented with that arithmetic system. There's a great deal more detail about all of this 
on the notes on IEEE floating point arithmetic that I've put up on the supplementary materials page of the Complexity Explorer website for this course if you're interested. For our purposes, the words machine epsilon are just a code word for small numbers, numbers that are small enough that the computer arithmetic system has trouble with numbers that are smaller than those. Now, how does all of that affect computer solutions of ordinary differential equations? Because it ties into all those errors we've been talking about. Time step, landscape geometry, and solver method are not the only things that affect the error. So does the arithmetic system of the computer. Here are some pictures that demonstrate all those effects. First, the time step. This is kind of a lousy scan. It's from a paper by Lorentz called Computational Chaos. And what he's showing you is three different pictures of the same dynamical system solved using three different time steps. And as you can see, the different time steps give you wildly different results on the same system. Indeed, the time step has caused a bifurcation in the dynamics. In the top picture, the dynamics look pretty periodic, but down here, they're very, very different. And there's definitely a topological change between these three pictures. And that is a bifurcation, again, induced by changing the time step of the solver. This is a picture from a PhD thesis that I supervised, uh, Dr. Natalie Ross. And the system in question is what's called the von Karman vortex street. And it's a bunch of vortices, two columns of them. And what they're supposed to do is move kind of upwards in this picture and jiggle back and forth. The two pictures here were generated using the same solver, the same differential equations, the same computer, the same time step, but the left-hand one is single precision arithmetic and the right-hand one is double precision arithmetic. And the right-hand one is more faithful to what the system really should do. And that's generally the case. If you use better arithmetic, the errors are smaller and the results are more accurate. This is a wonderful series. This is an integration of the differential equations that model the planets in the outer solar system. You can see the Sun in the center, and then there's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto at an odd angle. And this is a pretty good solver. It's a symplectic solver, so it preserves energy, as should be the case with orbits of planets. By the way, the inner rocky planets, like us, are left out of this because we're very small and we don't matter in the evolution of the outer solar system. If you use a slightly less good solver, the errors that that solver makes cause the planets to oscillate. If you use a even less good solver, Jupiter gets ejected. Now, we all know that Jupiter won't get ejected, so we laugh, but this is the kind of thing that can happen in solar systems when a star comes nearby. And so this is the kind of thing that can happen in this kind of dynamical system, but it's happening here not because it's physical, but because the solver did it. And that's kind of terrifying. This is like the Hubble Space Telescope turning quasars into nebulae. There are both things that you would expect to see in the behavior that you're looking at, but your observing instrument is mutating one into the other. And that's what makes numerical dynamics so scary. Those numerical dynamics, which can cause bifurcations, as you saw in that first picture from Lorenz's paper, can have results that look like real dynamical systems produce. And as you've seen over the past couple of units, those numerical effects come from the algorithms, come from the time step, come from the arithmetic. They also come from the dynamical system as well. So what you need to think about as a practitioner, you're faced with a result. You don't know whether it's right or not. What can you do in order to decide whether or not you should believe it? Or whether those results include dynamics that come from the numerics and not the real system. If the algorithms, the arithmetic, and the time step could be causing this, change them. Change the time step. See if it changes your results. If it doesn't, believe them more, but never all the way, because it always could be a little different if you changed it further. What I tend to do is reduce the time step until the dynamics stop changing, and then that will increase my belief that my results are right. You can use different solvers. Use fourth, fifth, sixth order runga cutter. You know, they're all built into MATLAB. Just throw them at the problem and see if the results change. If the results don't change, believe them a little bit more. It's always a good thing to change from single to double precision arithmetic and to see if your results change. You can never know that your results are perfect. You can just increase your belief that they're right. And as I mentioned before, you would always need to be careful about machine epsilon, floating point arithmetic effects, because if you make the time step too small, then numerical effects might bite you before the time step gets small enough to give you a good solution. So a couple of big picture takeaways from this lecture. Again, numerical solvers aren't always right. You need to keep that in mind, whether you wrote it or someone else wrote it. 
The ways in which they are wrong, you now understand, which means that you are now equipped to do what the lawyers call due diligence. You have some evidence, and you need to pound on it. It is your responsibility to pound on it before you believe it. So due diligence is important with numerical solvers.